My God, this is a masterpiece. I'm a bit of a picky eater when it comes to horror. The charcuterie board of spooky ookies is vast and encompasses many flavors, most of which I think are yucky. Jump scares, gore porn, tentacle porn, social commentary, whatever freaks you out, let your freak flag fly, and then hide under it when things get too tense. Personally, I wish I could call my taste refined, but it's really more so just specific, and there's nothing more specifically suited to my delicate sensibilities than watching Willem Dafoe farting in black and white. When I was a little kid, I was a certified Frady Cat, just an absolute ninny. I was scared of everything. I was scared of the Doc Ock scene from Spider-Man 2. Seriously, this schlock scared me out of a theater when I was like six. When I got older though, I started to understand that all my unchecked anxiety made it hard to process the emotional toll of conventional horror, especially because it so often lacked any kind of proper catharsis. Why am I telling you this? Well, therapy is expensive, but also because it's the exact reason I, and so many other people, love Robert Eggers' movies. When we talk about good horror, there's usually two things that immediately spring to the conversation. The first is the balance of tension and catharsis. The Thing, Halloween, Jaws, Alien, these are movies that know exactly how to build up their scares to create memorable moments and make sure we care when they happen. The other is substance, or I guess thematic relevancy, movies like Get Out, Rosemary's Baby, even Godzilla that make the most out of their parallels to real life problems. Real problems scare me a little too much, so I'm going to focus on the first option, specifically the way Robert Eggers uses tension and catharsis in creative and extremely effective ways. Barring John Wick's stunts and Ben Affleck's depression in the Justice League reshoots, there is nothing ever put to camera more real than the oppressive setting of a Robert Eggers film. This water is real, that liquor is probably real, that seagull thankfully isn't real, but this goat is very real, and he really cracked one of Ralph Einson's ribs on set. It's this commitment to realism that establishes such a deep aura of dread. Not unlike the stunts in John Wick, you can physically feel the authenticity to a point that in itself it manages to heighten the tension. Willem Dafoe's maddening gaslighting and domineering in the lighthouse, the unfathomable burden of sin that plagues the Puritan family of the witch, they're palpable. They reach out of the screen and pull you in trying to suffocate you like they do their protagonists. Extra special care is taken to research. The dialogue is as period accurate as it is at times incomprehensible. The costumes, the lighting, the unbridled rage of these poor, borderline abused actors, it's all in service of your immersion. The worlds of Robert Eggers' films are inherently terrifying, and feeling trapped in them is a living nightmare that you and the characters are experiencing together. The goal here is to create a deep-seated but sort of ethereal anxiety. Atmosphere and mood are prioritized. As opposed to outright scares, Eggers likes to brew his audience's discomfort in a big cauldron with creepy birds and baby guts for flavor, naturally sucking in tension from the environment. Period pieces are often used in horror to conveniently remove any technological advances that might move the plot along too fast, but Eggers uses painstaking realism to create a vacuum, removing modern context from what are essentially sinister folktales and leaving you with a sickening sense of uncertainty. That omnipresence of malaise keeps you on edge, unsure of exactly when something is going to happen, or even what could. In the hands of someone with less talent, or at least creativity, this is prime real estate for a lazy jump scare accompanied by a loud noise, rinse and repeat for two hours and then loosely connect it to The Conjuring. A generational voice like Eggers has so much more in mind. Like say, Willem Dafoe crop-dusting a dinky shack.
The witch and the lighthouse are similarly built inside of pressure cookers, the metaphorical equivalent of a rubber band stretched to its limit, waiting to snap. The logical end of the semiotic premise posed by the Dutch angle. I could keep going until they take back my English degree, but you, you get the point. Robert Eggers likes to make you squirm. Nobody wants to squirm for two hours, though. Just imagine the wear and tear on your brand new jeans. That's where relief comes in. Narratively speaking, it's sort of the lovable kid brother to catharsis, designed less to make the rubber band snap and more to slightly depressurize the cooker? I, I don't know how pressure cookers work. There's really no room in my studio to store one. Eggers' two features are built from more or less the same parts. Stories about toxic relationships compounded by isolation, anxiety, and fervent vice. But their sources of relief are where they differ significantly, both from each other and from the iconic pillars of horror. Individual moments of relief can be positive, which mostly exist as moments of levity, or negative, which encompasses pretty much everything else. When you watch a slasher, every kill is, strictly speaking, relief. Sure, it's bad, unless you're a sociopath, but the tension has been, at least for the moment, loosened, because as far as the narrative is concerned, progress has been made, and adding more chaos offers diminishing returns to the audience. You, as the viewer, can now exhale and unclench. Eggers has his own way of providing relief, Mostly because he kind of has to. His work is so slow-burning, provides such oppressive environments, that relief has to be dispersed in smaller increments throughout the entire narrative. Let's start with The Lighthouse, because it's easier to explain. I mentioned positive relief in horror movies usually comes in the form of levity, maybe an intimate moment or a joke to ease the suspense. In The Lighthouse, these moments are less so naturally woven into the story and more shaken into a particularly alcoholic Bloody Mary with equal parts guilt, power dynamics, and pent-up sexual frustration, and some rotten seafood to garnish. I'm doing a lot of food analogies. The point is, The Lighthouse is a weirdly funny movie, almost a black comedy, but it's weirdly funny because the comedy and the horror come from the exact same place. Thomas and Winslow are just landmines of emotion, eaten by their guilt and trapped both literally and metaphorically, forced only to interact with each other, swinging violently between codependent and resentful. It's toxic, it's gonzo, it's overtly homoerotic, it's just fucking weird, but as a result, the viewer can choose to see any given interaction as charming or disturbing and the progressive blurring of the distinction between those two is what makes The Lighthouse so overwhelmingly creepy. Speaking of creepy things and sexual frustration, let's talk about the witch's subtle incest subplot. Unlike The Lighthouse, the vices of the witch's characters are never charming and never visceral. They slink in the corner of the frame, and the only relief we get as the audience is when they finally show their faces. The repressive nature of their Puritan faith is sort of always undermined by what sinful assholes everyone in the family actually are. The tension again stems from and flows into these little moments like Caleb's invasive sexual thoughts about his sister, or the twins insisting they can talk to the goat. You know where it's going, but you know it can't be stopped because this family is doomed. All you can do is wait to see just how bad the penance is, and if Thomason is ultimately blamed for it. This is how negative relief operates on a more drawn-out level and interacts with the atmosphere. The witch's woods feel like a different world, but they're surprisingly similar, so sooner or later Thomason, and by proxy you, are prompted to ask if it's not in its own way better to just take the deal with the devil. It's not, but by then it's not really much of a choice anyway. At this point, you may be wondering what actually makes Robert Eggers' films so special, or I guess why his style is so magnetic for non-traditional horror fans. I could go on about how well shot and well written and well acted and such they are, but they are good conventional horror movies. I'm in no way here to call Eggers' work 
quote-unquote elevated horror. What I am here to say is that his thematic through lines scratch a very particular itch, especially regarding his use of catharsis. The endings of both The Witch and The Lighthouse are exercises in conditional euphoria. They cannot exist without the absolute slog that led to them, but they're also fundamentally tainted by them. They only just manage to avoid feeling unfair, to be satisfying in the face of the abuse the protagonists suffer throughout the movie. Thomason isn't really free in the coven, Howard doesn't really have any power in the Lantern Room. On some level, you'd know this, and in the lighthouse you actually see it, but it's not what the story has been about the whole time. This is the moment of rapture. The kettle boils over in the scenes leading to this. The protagonists make their pact. They were never good people in the first place, but they finally abandon their humanity after being pushed to the edge, and it ends in violence. The world opens up for them, but at the cost of becoming even more stationary within that world. Let's briefly take a look back at Slashers again, and the trope of the final girl. The final girl is the one who deserves to live, usually because she's the purest, or at the very least the smartest. In a way, slashers are movies about human vice, designed to partially pit the audience against the collection of one-dimensional jerk-offs who surround the final girl. They have to die, deserve to die for the most part, but she usually gets to live after confronting the killer because she's the moral center point of the narrative. Eggers' movies are, beyond a shadow of a doubt, about vice, but there's no moral compass in them. Thomason and Howard, or Winslow, whichever name you remember Robert Pattinson's character as, are victims of circumstance, but that's basically it. The price of desire, freedom, control, what have you, even in the face of oppressive circumstance, is effectively horror. There's not really any judgment passed on characters, even the one who literally signs a contract with Satan. To see them finally succumb is what you've ultimately been waiting for. It's the rooted source of the horror. It has to happen, and it's glorious and terrifying, and you don't really know if it's what you want, but here you are. It's not a moment that's for everyone. In the charcuterie board of horror, it's like the olives in the corner. Bitter, salty, a little out of place. Now, I hate olives, but that's exactly how I like by scares. I think it's how a lot of anxious people like their fear, constantly surrounding them like it does all day in real life. The difference is, in a Robert Eggers film, that fear comes to a head, and it explodes outward in a way it's just not allowed to. Punishment be damned. By the way, I didn't really know where else to put this, but Robert Eggers' brother Max actually co-wrote The Lighthouse with him, based on an unfinished short story by Edgar Allan Poe. Little fun fact for you. It has nothing to do with the video, I just think it's cute that they write together. Okay, bye now. <laughs>